Welcome to Cartoonist Cafe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. Exciting one today, Ed. How to Color Comics the Marvel Way. Very a little cool. addendum appendix to the How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way. But first, what's new? Patreon.com slash Ed is where I'm serializing my current Red Room comic strips for the early adopters. There's going to be a print edition of these comics coming out on a hopefully monthly basis in 2021. But for now, if, if you can't hold your horses, three bucks will get you the archive. Uh, issue one is on the Patreon right now. And I serialize new pages uh, every Tuesday. And that's patreon.com slash edpiscor, link below this video. Yep. My news is that Street Angel, this hardcover collection of the first volume of Street Angel, is now officially out of print. Uh, We sent the last cases to the distributor this week, so if you want to pick this up, now is the time to get it before it's uh, hard to find. You can find that, for a little while at least, still at your comic shops or online wherever you buy comics. And Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive, this is the Image Comics collection, full color. These are all standalone, so either book is a good starting point, but I did want to let everybody know that this is out of print, and uh, we don't plan to reprint it at this time. I'm sure it'll come back and print at some point, but if you want a copy, now's the time to get it. All right. Marvel Age. I used to buy this when I was a kid. This was kind of like Marvel's uh, info book, you know, usually plug in their own stuff. And when I was buying, it was a little bit later than issue 13. And it was really just plug in stuff at that point. But this one's pretty cool. It has some uh, some fun articles in here. And the one we're going to look at today, literally how to color comics, the Marvel way, even the same logo and stuff as the famous book. And we have a video on that one. So, uh, you know, you can you can look through our archives and find kind of the the book that's that spawned this article. And the very first picture, Doc Martin's uh, color inks, color dyes. This is how comics would have been colored originally. And uh, this is your kit, Ed, of Dr. P.H. Martin's color dyes. Where'd you get this? Tell, tell me about this. This was a Kubert school, like in your art kit, whenever uh, you, know, you put your money down and you show up, they hand you a big bag of stuff and say, this is the shit you're going to be using for uh, for your tenure here as a student. When I saw these things, man, it reminded me of that Abrams Marvel book when you see how they're putting together Marvel Comics at the very end, the kind of tutorial. But also, you look closely on uh, those photos of Jack Kirby when he's painting those those crazy like Argo paintings, and you see that those colors are done with this stuff. And this these colors, man, high-octane fucking color. Like Easter... Think these are dyes. These are not watercolor paints. Uh, think of your Easter eggs, like literally, like the magenta is so bright, it singes your eyeballs. No idea why they decided to opt to use very hard to use dyes (laughs) as color guides. And uh, we'll discover that you could pretty much color a guide with with anything. And as long as you have the proper codes, it's going to be colored the way it should be. Yeah, the article goes through and it, you know, it talks about the tools. It talks about these Dr. Martin dyes and it talks about how you create the various colors because at this time there are 64 colors. This is what the colors look like that are available for Marvel and DC comics. And these are based on CMYK, uh, you know, combinations. They start out with zero, you know, this would be no yellow, but 25% blue, 50% blue, hundred percent blue. I used to think that 75 was an option, but it wasn't in this 64 pack. And what you would do is mix up approximations of these colors. If you were a colorist, and then you would color on like a, like a Xerox, like a reduced Xerox of the page. You would color just kind of approximating these colors and then put in these codes. And those codes would then go to the person who's going to create the actual color separation. So the color guides were an approximation. It's a lot of work. I'm surprised that's the step that was done then. So so what is what is color separations? I mean, you take a look closely at these at these values and you see you see these these dots right and what 25 percent is that's like a 25 percent gray screen that if you take a look closely uh, i don't know if you could see it on the i think it'll be impossible to see on you know here. what you might see is on the back okay, here yeah, yeah, yeah. this is blown up example to uh you know make make it more dramatic what these are but they're dots and yeah. so those dots would then be printed in cyan magenta yellow or black, although black wasn't black, you would get 100% or zero. But when you're mixing colors, that's what these would allow you to do in the printing process. Yeah, so you have a 25% screen, you have a 50% gray screen, and then you just have pure black plate. And on each of the different colors, CMYK, they would pay, cut out and paste down these black screen, zipatone screens, and and 
delineate the color that way. Very it, arcane. Man, it's tedious. Yeah. It, it, it sounds like the worst process ever. It's funny because, like, when I did Aphrodisiac, I was approximating this color method. Because this is the palette that was used for decades in mm-hmm. comic book coloring, especially like the Marvel DC coloring. This was pretty standard. And like I said, I messed up and had the 75%, which would be between these two columns. Um, I could have used this article 15 years ago, Ed. But they go through, and it's really detailed and technical about that. Like, even naming, like, how they mix up the different blues or yellows, because they're not straight out of the Doc Martin. It'll right. be like a couple of colors that will give you, you know, magenta or cyan. Everybody had their flesh tone uh, at school. Like, Joe Kubert would tell you, you know, it's a little magenta, it's two drops of magenta, a little sepia, everybody. And, and so, like, we would all have the set, but then you could buy just the bottles, and everybody had their own bottle of, like, Caucasian flesh tone. <laughs> And it was all different. Pre-mixed. Yeah. It's so funny, because how big could the demand have been? But it was just enough for Doc Martin to uh, d- to be profitable to make that bottle. <laughs> <laughs> they go through and they name like some specific stuff. So Captain America, his colors are Y, R, B, and white. And you, know, you can see what those things are. The B, of course, being blue. The Y, R being a 100% mix of the uh, yellow and magenta. And that's kind of how you get your red. It's a, it's a warmer color, magenta, a little bit on the pink side. So you add that yellow and you get a nice red. Uh, and they, you know, they do it with a few. This is a really in-depth article. It's pretty fun. It's part of why I, I wanted to highlight it. But they have like the Hulk colors yeah. uh, for both his green and the, uh, the famous purple pants. So it's, it's instructive to see this kind of stuff. And again, most of this is pretty technical up to this point. And then we have Jim Shooter, editor-in-chief at the time. He comes in and he talks about the fundamentals of coloring comics, um, the Marvel way. And he says, you know, like a lot of this stuff, it isn't codified anymore. But when he came into the business 20 years before this, there was a system. And the system was heroes were 100% primary colors, um, Captain America being a great example of that here. And then your villains were all uh, solid secondary colors. So your primaries are your blue, red, and yellows. Your secondaries, your orange, purples, and greens. Something that Alan Moore used to great effect in Watchmen, or I guess John Higgins was the colorist there. But it was something I always thought was cool in Watchmen was that color palette, which shifted those and went to the secondary colors, the orange, greens, and purples that you didn't see as much in traditional superhero comics. When that first gets changed... It's very subversive. It's very effective. It looks different. Um, And so he goes through some of that and he talks about like the basic goals, which uh, clarity, depth, and contrast, and how that actually applies with planes. So foreground, middle ground, background. Your background's going to be much less contrast. Don't color in the doorknobs and all the different books on the shelf. Just make it one color and make it a color that's, you know, 25 or 50%, which is uh, a lighter color, a little bit less uh, saturated. That'll recede. You want your characters to pop, to come forward. And again, these are kind of Marvel techniques and ideas. You know, depending on what kind of story you're telling, it may be very different. You may not want those characters popping off the page. And also, we don't even color using this technique anymore. But But in terms of the superheroes, yes, exactly. So it's kind of neat to see that spelled out. It's not something that I have seen very often. Uh, You know, and it, it applies to things like covers. Same deal. You know, you're trying to draw attention and make those covers pop. Same principles of depth, clarity, and contrast. Yeah, like the little piece that they talk about with the covers, it makes perfect sense because if you take a look at the... Um, I was always curious about like the, the Marvel covers. There'd be a lot more modeling and interesting things going on well back into the Silver Age. And it really all has to do with the shit paper that yes. the interior paper is. Like they like if you had... If you used those same tools and did the same modeling on this shit paper like you're not looking at a smooth surface when you look close there's there because of the coarseness there's a million little shadows from the grain of the paper now you double that with band-aid dots of color on top you're going to create a fucking muddy mess so um just seeing that in there like sort of crystallize some things in my head for me yeah and then there are some standard devices that he talks about such as knockouts This would be like coloring a group of something the same color, for instance. Or in this example, it's this foreground. This isn't a natural color that these would be, you know, it's a cop, it's a barrier, it's the ground plane and a tree, all the same kind of purple. Yeah, because what that does is frames your action, where you want the eye to go. Yeah. Uh, It talks about highlights, which would be almost the inverse of this. You know, if you want the human torch to seem like he's hot, you put some yellow, orange, white highlights on something that's next to the human torch. But of course, you can't use that too much it loses its impact so very sound kind of principle stuff 
again, kind of impressed by this article because it does all make sense to me. Um, Ed, you're talking about the paper. This is something that I really had to adjust to once I started doing color work because you don't have any of these things. The the porous paper, the texture of the paper, the dots, that gives it a certain texture. Yeah. Once that goes away and you're printing on like perfect smooth paper with digital printing where the dots are so small you can barely see them with your eye, then you have super smooth, everything's super smooth. Like yeah. you almost have to program in textures, imperfections, things to make the characters feel a little bit more 3D and pop and also to interact the colors in things like black line. Yeah. Because here the black line isn't black. It's gray. It's inconsistent because of the paper that it's printed on. So it sort of blends the color and the lines together. When you get the perfect paper, that black is like, all these colors are just separate. Yeah. And so you got to find ways to bring those colors together, which newsprint used to do perfectly. And as you get into better paper, that's a challenge. They talk about that. Mm -hmm. This is long before digital coloring, but it is color for high quality paper. And so he goes through Baxter, Hudson, and Mando stocks. Baxter, we hear a lot. And the first comics, I think, that printed on Baxter paper, the one that that I always see cited is Camelot 3000. Baxter paper was this white, very white paper. It didn't bleed like newsprint. And so these are the same colors that you are seeing in this palette. But when you put it on this paper that's like good paper, guess what? This is much brighter and flat than what you see on newsprint. And uh, the cool thing about the article is it is it is topical up to that moment. And they are flat out saying, like, this is a new technology and we haven't figured it out yet. But here are some thoughts. Like, maybe we don't put 100% magenta where we would on newsprint. Maybe we tone it back 50%. Bingo. That's exactly right. And that's kind of what they go through and they talk about. Um, your example exactly, Ed, of, of you know using less saturation because of the way the paper receives that. Um, some of the other paper stocks that I, I thought I would show an example of, this is Hudson paper. Um, again, super white. The difference between this and Baxter is this is glossy. So you can kind of see as I turn it how shiny it is. Uh, again, the, the ink all sits on top of this. You know, if you're going to put 100% yellow, it is going to be super bright. Um, this is Barry Windsor Smith coloring on this paper. And so you would see artists and colorists learning what, you know, how this stuff interacts, how this works. And, uh, and it was, it was a living document at, at the moment that the article's <laughs> written. So, so like they can't even, and they say that they can't even point to examples where it's done great. And they even talk to people like Glennis Ween, who's like, I don't know, I have to see how this stuff looks in print, uh, before I, I, I adjust. So I'm flying by the seat of my pants here. She's been working, you know, 15 years at that point. One of the comics that I credit with like really helping to figure out how to color on this new paper is Kevin Nolan's Outsiders Annual. And we may look at this in depth at some point. Oh, we have to. But what you see him doing, and and it's speculated on in this article, is using these colors that maybe on newsprint you didn't use as much. You know, some of these um, some of these greens and blues and things that would be very desaturated. This would be gray if you put it on newsprint. But on this nice paper, suddenly it's like you have access to a different set of those colors. Same 64 combination, but they look totally different on this paper. And, you know, Nolan, I don't know why he knew this or how he got this insight, but really kind of this is a how to color on Baxter paper tutorial for a lot of my friends. Yeah, Certainly sure. that's how we kind of pass this around. Because Baxter paper comes up often in uh, in modern (laughs) comics coloring. We talk about Baxter paper quite a lot, right? Um, Full color process, full process color. This is an interesting one too. And we've definitely talked about some of the different coloring process that you would see throughout the 80s, usually with uh, indie publishers that are trying to compete with Marvel and DC and get noticed. They would introduce some new coloring to uh, make their books look better. Image did it in the 90s when they bring in digital on uh, coated paper. But they talk about full process color is Marvel's answer to, okay, we've got nice paper. How do we do this? They would do full color uh, on 11 by 17, and then they would shoot it like uh, like you would reproduce a photo. If you were going to print a photograph, you shoot it, and the separations come out of that process. And so this is Steranko's Captain America, and it's recolored for this edition. And we had looked at some of this stuff. We looked at one of the backup stories, and we were trying to figure out, like, what is this coloring technique that we're seeing? Because it's different than the original printings. You know, it's not using the same film. And that's that's the answer. You know, like he spells it all out. And they do say magic marker. F- full process color. Yeah, they said magic marker is some of the color that's applied. 
and you're still seeing the experimentation. Like, oh, what can we do with color if we're going to reproduce it this way? So, you know, in a lot of ways, this is still everybody trying to figure out this new, what's available, new technologies for color in comics. And of course, the gold standard is is like Lynn Varley, Dark Knight Returns. That's That's full color and a beautiful application of such. Yeah, and... Concluding remarks is just about, you know, if you're trying to apply for this job, if you want to be a colorist, what they're looking for, uh, you know, and, and kind of going for it in those early pages, which is pretty cool to see. I mean, I was reading this stuff for penciling and inking and, and everything. This is if you want to be a colorist. And then profiles of some of their coloring staff. So Marie Severin stands out as being, you know, the queen of comics in a lot of ways, going back to coloring EC comics in the 50s. Talk about a pedigree and experience. The Christy Scheel uh, AKA Max Scheel, her background is painting. And uh, a lot of these colorists have a background in like, in, you know, they went to school for painting or something that had to do with color. So it's kind of common, but like we pointed out her coloring, like in the eighties, Marvel. Born again, Daredevil born again. Amazing. She's a colorist for that. And she's amazing. Paul Becton, uh, one of his highlights for me, we'll probably show it off at some point is Armored Wars 2 with uh, JRJR John Byrne. And he, uh, his application of just the absence of color using white to amazing effect. I've never seen it done better than in his application of color on some of those issues. The living laser issues are the ones that you want to fuck with. That's there. amazing. I didn't realize that was him. Uh-huh. Those are great color, and, color uh, examples. Glynis Ween, man, she's a part of one of the comics' greatest collaborations with uh, Chris Claremont, John Byrne, Terry Austin, Tom Morzikowski, like as a unit, as Voltron. Yes. You know what I'm saying, man? She's a part of that fucking giant robot. So kind of a cool article, especially if you're interested in that part of the production of comics. I was uh, I was real impressed by this article. Like it, it really gets in depth. It goes, you know, kind of in, in, in deep into the esoteric qualities of what you're doing as a colorist in comics and, and the tools you're working with. So I think it's a good article, especially with the title of how to color comics the Marvel way. This would be a great addendum Absolutely. On, on the back of that book. Like add this as an appendix in future printings, but uh, pretty cool to read about. I appreciated the article and I appreciated the conversation, Jimmy. Should we get out of here? Yes. K favors, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when the next vids are available. Street Angel in stores now and out of print. So get it while it's hot. Patreon.com slash Ed Piscor. Serializing my Red Room comic. Issue one's up there now. Three bucks. Get your archive new strips every Tuesday. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe newsletter at the links below this video to keep up with all things Cartoonist Kayfabe. You can find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. And if you order those t-shirts and merchandise between November 20th and 26th, use the promo code Kayfabe free ship for free shipping on all of your orders. Jim, we got comics of color of our own, man. Give these guys your marching orders. Read more comics.